And that, Gary, is why I just don't think roofies are a good idea. Hey, guys, we're live. Welcome to Beastly Thoughts Live oh. Podcast, the number one source for video game-related discussion on the Internet, as judged by Gary's mom. Recorded live on Twitch.tv, <laughs> Briar Rabbit, every Sunday evening, and pot broadcast throughout the world via YouTube, iTunes, and Podbean. Today, we'll be taking a look at the latest in video games, as well as discussing the pros and cons of mid-generation console refreshes like the PlayStation Pro and Xbox Scorpio. But first, let's take a look back at the week that was and hear from the crew about what we've been playing. It was obviously a scripted intro. It was the first time I read it, and it was a little awkward. <laughs> well done, though. It's fine. Uh, you know, really great good. job. Great job. It wasn't, it wasn't a gag about my mom, to be honest. Of, of all the video game podcasts that she listens to, this is the only one. So there you go. <laughs> hey, there you go. Good Therefore, 100%. it's her favorite. It's 100%. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mom. So I want to talk about what we've been playing. And this week, we actually all played the same thing. We played it together, and it was spectacular. <laughs> well, it was so fun. Yeah, it was it so was. fun. So we got we got together. We played some PUBG this week. Beastly, it was your very first time in PUBG. Is that right? Like you hadn't yes. even had a practice game before? No. Oh, my gosh. And, Robbie, it was pretty early on in your PUBG career, too. I think you'd been practicing a little bit that day. But other than that... But it, I mean, we did pretty well. I felt like you know we were we were getting down with some somebody. murder. We we're yeah, we we're doing some murder. It was good. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, well, for me, I had I had a great time with you guys. I'm just not a PC player, so it was really hard for me to get over that hump, especially in real time in a group with a hundred people. You really don't know what to do. You have no idea in a PC game how hard it can be to get into a car sometimes. <laughs> and, and I had some real issues with that. But yeah, you it was a sure did. I had, a, I had a great time, and uh, it's something I look forward to getting back into with you guys. Man. You want to talk about some of the, the great great moments there, Brian? Uh, I, you know, there's been so many, and I just don't remember them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we all we all had moments. I, I honestly couldn't believe it that I actually killed somebody, and it was a guy who got caught slipping. He was completely slipping. I was in the corner, and he was crawling around next to me. And I was so shocked that his amateurish – move he was on the ground looking away from me i just shot him up in the... i think Go the guy ahead. was in a bathroom break basically i'm gonna be honest <laughs> he was I, afk i don't think he was i don't think yeah, he was actually yeah. at the keyboard yeah, taking a whiz I, I think you had a freebie there so yeah well you know i'll take what i can get gary okay so what did you guys think obviously we were having a lot of fun we we're we we're laughing a lot but what did you guys actually think about playing the game with a group because it's such a different game i feel like with a group as opposed to just playing it solo uh, it's almost. It feels to me like a horror game when I play it, it solo, mm -hmm. but with a group, it feels much more tactical. You're communicating constantly. The adrenaline really starts pumping when you're you're doing call outs. You're like, oh, he's to the southwest, 185 degrees. Go, you know, he's behind that tree, behind that tree. You know, yeah. yeah. You know, everybody's driving, and it's just a lot of it's a lot of communication and a lot of teamwork that is required to kind of keep going on and not getting shot at. What you guys think of that? Well, I mean, as somebody who's new to the game, let me just say this real quick. The only real experience I've had is with you guys as a team. I played three matches or four yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's something I don't want to do. I don't want to play by myself now that I've kind of been broken in right. with the team. Right. That, ta that tactical feel, that being able to talk to your teammates, you know what's going on. They're in this building. There's nobody there. Maybe you're all looking in a certain direction. You know the enemy's here. They're calling out, like you said. To me, that's very – it's paramount to a game like this. And to be in it by yourself – takes away that whole aspect, the whole mystique of having that team-centered feeling. And for me, it's something I don't really want to do by myself now because I went in there yesterday, I got my ass handed to me, and there was nobody there to laugh. And there's so, nobody to laugh at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to laugh. <laughs> or laugh so, with you. Well, you, you me, live stream it, and we'll laugh, we'll laugh from the comfort of our own homes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's always a plan. But, yeah, right? I, I, I really like that. That's funny you say that. So you don't like playing solo at all. I mean, it's still a pretty enjoyable experience, but if I had to choose one versus the other, I'd always have a team. Always. Yeah, of course. Uh, to be able to talk to people and laugh and lollygag and joke and, and have someone there to help you if you're in dire straits and vice versa, it's, it's just so much better. It feels a lot – you're much more dire straits when you're by yourself. Oh, yeah, for sure. If, if, that's why I say people. it feels like a horror game to me Yeah. when I'm playing by myself because you're, you know, you're in this – you're in a house and you're looting and all of a sudden you hear something you're like – what the fuck yeah. was that? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, had, I had a really terrifying moment yesterday. Uh, the very first game I played, I jumped out of the plane, and I accidentally hit F when I was, like, really, really high. 
and I was getting shot from the ground. I was yeah. still coming down when everybody what? had already gone into the houses oh. and looted them. I hit F and I pulled my parachute out when I was like really high up in the oh, sky. Oh, shit. So I was still coming down and I saw people just running and I <laughs> there's bullets coming at me getting hit while I was in midair. Also, there was a really scary situation where I, I jumped into an area where I thought was going to be desolate. But as I was coming down, there was at least 20 people around me in the air. And they were all closer to the buildings than I was. And so when I landed, <laughs> I ran straight to the woods. The art of the <laughs> jump, I think, is pretty important in that game. It's figuring out strategically what your destination is going to be and then getting to that destination as quickly as possible because you do not want to be the second guy in a, in a room with a gun or without yeah. a gun, right? It's like you don't want to be yeah. running to a gun and lose that race. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> that's, that's really not going to go well. Situation. A lot of... I, I got a lot of the uh, the strategy I've learned for myself that works really well for me as a solo player is to not actually jump to loot, but jump for a car and then drive that car to some place that I know that nobody could have jumped to, right? Oh. And go loot that area and then come back Brilliant. and start murdering. That's really started working for me. Gary, what, what did, what's your experience been? Have you been playing solo at all? Yes, I was going to say that I've had the opposite experience of BC. So I came into it as... I think I picked the game up months, well, not months ago, about about six weeks ago now, five mm -hmm. weeks ago. Played it solo, spoke about it on the podcast, and then put it down, didn't touch it again. Really didn't feel that. I thought it was a good game, but it wasn't something that was keeping me addicted and keeping me coming back. Mm -hmm. Then we had the team event, um, and that whet my appetite so much to get back involved. And I have been playing the crap out of that game. So, you know, I've had, I think, my first number two finish. I uh, didn't, didn't quite get the chicken dinner, but I was close oh, enough wow. that I was shaking at my keyboard i mean that game gives you a real adrenaline buzz and i used to play destiny for that um for trials like you know playing trials i just it, it, i don't get that feeling anymore in destiny and I, i've missed it so for me going into PUBG and starting to play competitively again and wanting to win has been really really great and I, i'd attest that to the team experience that i had that showed me the fun you could have in that game mm -hmm. and i now just want to get better uh, and that's what i've been trying yeah wow. yeah we I, i've been playing a ton too and I feel like when I'm playing as a solo, a lot of it is just practicing. It's like practicing the gunplay, practicing, you know, how f quickly I can d get things done. And so that instead of having to think about what I'm doing in a firefight, it's all just natural, right? Yeah. It's like all of that stuff is muscle memory. So I can just focus on the fight. And that's, like I said, it's playing as a single. I feel like I'm practicing for for my time as with a team. Yeah, Robbie, have you I been playing it at all since... Since the event? Yeah, I've been playing it a ton, uh, both with people and with solo. So my experience solo, it's definitely very different solo versus a team. You know, a team, you're talking, you all kind of like, we're going to go here and we're going to do this. Solo, it's like you're alone. You know, you kind of just got to do everything on your own. It's way more terrifying, I will say. There are some matches where you just die right off the start or you just don't make it very far. Some games solo, though, I have gotten to the top five. I got to number four, I think, once, and then I got to number... Seven, actually not wow. quite top five, but close. So, and it's so intense. Like, it's ridiculous playing alone. It's like 10 times more scary because there's people all around you and you're alone. So you really have to make sure you execute things well and get the loot you need. And I think it's easier to just stay bunkered down in the house too when you're playing alone because you can just kind of, you know, wait and see where people are going. I feel I mean, like it's yeah. easier to outplay people as well when you're solo. And that's what I really like because in I would agree with that, Gary. Games, yeah, in team games, there's, to always, stay hidden too. there's two people calling out everything that you do. So in duos or squads, you know there's more than one pair of eyes watching everything. So you make a shot, and suddenly they're saying, I'm hit, I'm hit. It's coming from east, whatever. Yeah. In solo, that guy's yelling, I'm hit, into his screen, and no one's hearing him. You know, you just, right. you're, you're taking <laughs> him out silently. And then you can bait, because, you know, other people in that town, they're thirsty for blood. They hear the gunshot, and they're coming out. So one kill can often snowball into three, four, five kills if you're well positioned and know what you're doing. I, I actually did exactly that yesterday, Gary. Is I had one game, like I, I had come home from work from my photo job, from a, a photo shoot, and we were going out to dinner. So I had like room for one game. I had like 45 minutes. Of, I'll just play one game of PUBG. And the circles ended up kind of pushing us all down to the military island down at the bottom of the map. So I was lucky enough to get a boat and I took my boat all the way around that island. So came I pulled up to shore on the south side of that island. So I was pretty sure 
that I was going to be able to push into the island with nobody at my back, right? But I was also like, well, I'm not going to be doing anything for like 10 minutes because I'm just going to be waiting for everybody to like, you know, make their way down to me. So I started firing off rounds to try and bait people to me because I knew yeah. that, you know, they'd hear that and be like, oh, there's somebody, there's, a, there's somebody weak over there because he just got into a gunfight. So, and then like, sure as, sure as hell, people started like just showing up, like running down this hill and I just pop them off. Cause I had a, I had a car sniper rifle and I was just able to pop them off with the car and it, it was a gorgeous thing. I made it to top four and then a guy with a scar, I just ne never saw him. He just like, yeah. he just wiped me out. But it, it was a good thing. Cause my wife was kind of getting pat pissed cause I was getting late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Could have had that what? chicken dinner though. The chicken dinner is the tastiest. Know, yeah, of you all. could have the chicken dinner over, you know, the restaurant dinner. So. I, I I like to say okay. to all the console gamers out there who watch the show and listen to the podcast, I don't know what's happening. Uh, I'm I'm actually part of this situation now. I'm actually considering buying a gaming PC. Um, yes, got to do it. The guys that have been talking to me about it, it's really Gary. He sell he. I don't know what he's doing. Maybe he's making me sell my soul. I think he secretly he, works for what, Amazon, man. It's worked on Briar, too. Yeah, just makes but him buy a ton of shit. I, I'm really. I, I was talking to my wife about it, and uh, it's something that we, we're going to go ahead and invest in, and uh, so I can stay up to date with these guys and play these kind of games. This is a great experience, man. Mm. Uh, it's more fun than I've had playing a video game in a long time. It's been many, many months since the Beastly Thoughts crew has gotten together and played a game, and that was three hours. That was some of the best gaming I've had in goddamn for a long time. I'm it really happy we did that. It was a lot and of fun. And we're going to do it. Do it again. Yeah, Real we're going to do it again Tuesday. We're going to start around 5.30, 6-ish uh, Eastern time. 5.30, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Around that time. Kind of depends on when everybody gets home from work and everybody can get booted up and ready and get in there. But uh, we should be around that time. That should be a lot of fun. I mean, last week was a blast. Um so yeah, more to come. Like Gary come ran me over with a car too. Well, building on your um, point, basically around PC gamer and becoming a PC gamer, I don't think is is that transition. I feel like if you're a gamer, you're a gamer on any platform you go on. And my definition of, of PC gaming is it's almost a definitive version of console gaming. So the other thing that very briefly I want to touch on what I've been playing and explain to people why I don't have a, a glowing review of, of Final Fantasy XIII too. Um, I did a hard drive reinstall, put an SSD into the computer, uh, and lost all my data. So that was like 35 hours of Final Fantasy lost, and that heartbreak was just too much for me. So I thought I'd pick up another mm -hmm. title. And I've never been a Dark Souls fan. I've never liked Dark Souls. I played Dark Souls 2 on the PS4, the, the remaster. Um, and at 30 frames, it just, it, I don't know. You say I'm a, a frame snob, but I just, I couldn't Controls get the movement right. Controls were very uh, stiff, I will say that. Yeah, on so, console, it can be stiff. I found a deal. I found the game of the year, Dark Souls 3, for $20, physical, with a Steam key. Um, got home, put it in. 4K, Ultra, 60 frames. I am loving that game. Really getting into Dark Souls. And ultimately, I'm playing a console game with an Xbox controller. I'm just using the PC as the, mm -hmm. the vehicle to play it. So, you know, whether I'm playing that on a PC or whether I'm playing that on a console, it really it, it's indistinguishable. I am a Dark Souls gamer. You know, I don't think we need to lineate ourselves and say, you're PC, I'm console. No, we're, we're all enjoying Dark Souls. But yeah, that game's great. You know, I'm 10 hours in and I, you know, I can actually say I'm enjoying a Dark Souls game. So, yeah, it's been good. Yeah, Dark Souls 3 personally was probably my favorite of the series. That and Bloodborne, both Bloodborne. amazing games. Loved them both. Bloodborne is the only one that I actually had the balls to beat. <laughs> yeah, I feel you, man. Great game. So has anybody else been playing anything besides PUBG that they want to talk about this week, or should we move right into the topic of the week? I mean, I've been playing a lot of PC stuff this week. I've been playing some games. Um, just pretty much been playing a, a lot of the Metro series because I love those games, and I've oh, yeah. kind of beaten them both now. Another game I've been playing on PC this week as well is a game that I really loved when it came out. One of my favorite series in gaming, and it's uh, Bioshock Infinite. I haven't played it since it first came out and been playing on PC, ultra settings, 60 frames. It runs great. It's beautiful, and I love the story in that game. I just love the characters. I love Booker and Elizabeth, and especially the story towards the end of the game gets really nuts. I'm sure, yeah, have you guys beaten <laughs> Bioshock Infinite? Yeah, like, it gets sure. really crazy. I have, yes. Yeah, it's, it's probably my favorite. This, I'm not going to spoil like it for anyone who hasn't played it, but, oh, my God, the story just gets incredible. So, yeah. That game is gorgeous, to too. It, it, not just yeah. on PC, on any platform you're playing on. I think yeah, I played it, it first on the 360, right? Is, did Even it on last gen. Yeah. It looked solid, yeah. It was 
in, insane. Just like these floating like islands of city blocks and like the theme of kind of that like early, I don't know, what is it? What would you say like 1920s, 1910s? <laughs> Yeah, like, like, like kind of mixed yeah. with like all of a sudden yeah. you hear like a Cindy Lauper song. It was like, it was so, it was just a cool world to explore. I was just want to have fun. So much. Yeah. Shout out, shout um, out to Cindy Lauper. Yeah, for sure. What oh, yeah. I love about Infinite was the way that it so cleverly <laughs> sidestepped the misstep of um, Bioshock Two, and created a uh, perfect loop between one and three that you had a narrative that played right the way through. So if you just played one and then Infinite. You'd have a great story that that explained the entire purpose of of both words. So cool. yeah, to me, yeah. Infinite's a great game. And and Briar, I've I've got to disagree. If you've played Bioshock Infinite in 4K Ultra, man, Columbia looks beautiful. I could go and live there tomorrow. It looks great on the 360 too, though. I I mean, yeah, it looks better in 4K. Of course it does. You know, I'm not stupid. I'm not that's, blind. That's kind of like. But it, I played it originally on the. Uh, I've actually bought that game three times. So Bought it originally Damn. on the 360, played it all the way through, and I loved it. I actually bought it on my PC uh, when I was running a uh, Mac. So it was like I was booting my Mac into Windows, and I bought it on Steam there. Uh, and then I bought it again on Steam again because I have a different account now. <laughs> <I wanted> to... <laughs> Old school boot, boot camp, bro? Using boot Jeez, camp? Boot Mac camp. for yeah. PC games. Yeah. What the yeah. hell? That's just wrong. You gotta do what you gotta do, no. Robbie. No. You gotta do what you gotta do, man. That's it took too a while to come around. He, he came around finally. To I'm Windows. not really around. I still fucking hate Windows, yeah. man. I fucking hate Windows something fierce. <laughs> it's not as bad as it was when Windows 8. Windows 10 is much better than Windows 8 was. Yeah. Yeah, but if yeah, I could totally. just if I could just run Mac OS and like game yeah, on it, like if they made the hardware that I wanted, like I'd be I would have never bought a PC. But gaming on a Mac prior. Come on, come on. No. You know, I don't even fucking think you know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) You're just parroting bullshit that you've heard. (laughs) Maybe it's just because people love to throw shit at Mac. I don't know. I've just never really cared. Mac's fine, but I've never really had a Mac computer. Mac's are great computers, just not great for gaming. That's what I mean, yeah. I think they're good for everything else. the The thing with Macs is that you can't... You can. You can you can build a PC and then put Mac OS on it. You can, like, kind of... Like make it happen, but Apple just isn't selling hardware that really appeals to power users anymore, which is a real shame. Mm-hmm. They want that 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 kind of social aspect, that social arena where people can just get in and just go, and you don't have it's to. Everything's got to be lighter and slimmer yeah. and prettier. Whereas you yeah. know, I, I still want the pretty, but I, I want the power that I used to get from them. I want the power. Yeah. It's like they build it for ease of access too, Brian. People who aren't well, that's really... the great thing about OS X, man, is the ease of access. The operating system is so stable and it's so easy to use, and it just makes so much sense. As opposed to Windows, where I mean, shit is just. I mean, the fact that there's still a registry in Windows is goddamn ridiculous. <laughs> I hope everybody's watching this live. This is amazing. <laughs> Briar does not fuck with Windows. Talking uh, about hardware that appeals to power users and yeah. wanting power at your hardware. Yeah. I think it's time we dug into our Beastly Roundtable for this week. That's what do you think, idea. guys? Absolutely. Yeah. So the topic for this week is mid-generation console upgrades. More choice for the consumers or just plain bad for business? So by means of intro, we all know the Sony PS4 Pro is out and Microsoft are soon to launch their own high-end variant of current generation consoles, which have been marketed as hardware for enthusiasts that want the best possible version of their games that and they're prepared to pay for it ultimately. These machines are a premium and they've created choice for consumers uh, previously only offered to their PC counterparts. Saying that, not everything has been received so positively and with the choice of hardware comes division in the community. So those who have opted to buy into this and those who haven't and are being accused of holding back their higher powered counterparts. What Mm. do we think of mid-generation consoles? Great for gamers, bad for gamers, or too early to know? I'll go first. I actually, after owning the the PS4 Pro and playing it and and spending lots and lots of time enjoying it, I see that it does have certain perks, but I don't think that those perks are warranted for a whole new price point, uh, for people to jump all on board for a potential of what the future could be with the console, and then we get what we got here. Iterative change is just that. The change that gamers really want 
is, is very close to what PCs are. 60 frames per second, 1080p, higher resolutions than 1080p. And even with the PS4 Pro, we're not getting that. We bought a new system with, with the hopes and dreams that were sold to us by Sony and, and people in their marketing departments. But really what we got is another PS4 that's able to do just a little bit more than the original PS4. I, I think with iterative change, the days of the next generation console are going to go away. I remember having a PlayStation 1, and I remember enjoying that console and playing it and spending hundreds of hours on my PS1. When I saw the PlayStation 2, there was a complete difference. When you first saw Tekken Tag Tournament, you knew this was something that, or you knew it was not possible on the PlayStation 1. And it was a complete change for the, the, the gaming ecosystem. Gamers knew that this new generation meant something different. PS4 Pro is not going to change the game for PlayStation 4 gamers. Iterative change isn't going to change the game. And I think as long as these companies do this to nickel and dime the consumer and get more, more and more money from the consumer, we're going to lose real change. Iterative change isn't enough, in my opinion, especially if you got to spend more money to, for a new console that does very little compared to the one you already bought. Pretty much. Right. We talked We talked about this last week. I forget which one of you guys said it, but I think it may have been you, Briar. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn on the regular PlayStation 4 looks almost indiscernible from the one on the PlayStation 4 Pro. Unless you have you know, 4K I got, TV, I think that's it's a different that's story. That's the difference. I, I yeah. played them both. They are both side by side on both of these 4K TVs. Mm -hmm. My wife's, hers is, you know, just a regular PS4 connected to her 4K. My Pro is connected to mine. They both look great. You got to look a little bit, you know, harder to see that extra clarity of the actual 4K assets, but the one on the regular PlayStation 4 being played on a 4K TV looked phenomenal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, person, basically, never... just to interject there, I know you're saying that there's not been that generational leap with these pieces of hardware, but this hasn't been marketed as a generational leap. I think that's consumers, um, I guess, projecting that onto what Sony have said. If you look at what the PlayStation 4 Pro was meant to be, Mark Sterney, Sterney and other people at Sony have always said that this is a mid-generational upgrade not a generational sure. leap and you have to also bear in mind that there is a 100 dollar difference between the base hardware and the pro hardware this is not a completely new unit this is a hundred dollar variant if you want it and more choice for the consumer is never a bad thing you're making it sound like this is the alternative to the playstation 5 which we know it isn't no yeah well you make a good point there but we got to keep in mind i'm seeing the, this from a completely different perspective than a person who doesn't already own a PS4. My brother Joe, for instance, didn't own a, a base vanilla PS4. He bought the Pro when the Pro release. He got it on release day. For him, that's a much better value than someone like me who already has four PS4s in my mm -hmm. house buying a Pro for $400 and getting what I got out of it. Of course, I didn't. they didn't say, Mark Cerny didn't say, this is basically what the PS5 would be, but they did build it as something m much more powerful than the original PS4 that was going to be able to do a lot more than the PS4. Which it arguably so, is. It's 2.8, is it, times more powerful? In my opinion, they didn't, they didn't build it so much for a power thing. They really build it for 4K HDR. Like, they said, okay, you know, like, to me right now, this is kind of a weird time for a video game console because these things came out when 4K TVs were just beginning to hit the market. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the PlayStation 4 did. Now, the you know, Sony is out there selling 4K TVs. So Samsung, everybody's like interested in these 4K TVs. You can get Netflix in 4K. You can get Amazon TV in 4K. You know, there's all these services that provide 4K. And you know what? I'd like to game in 4K too, but none of the game consoles do that. I don't think that they're, they're gonna, there's going to be a PS5 Pro. I don't think there's going to be a PS6 Pro. I think it was a very, a very targeted time to say for Sony to say, you know what? Like people want a game in 4K. Not everybody, you know, and we're not gonna we're not gonna separate, you know, the pro gamers from the base gamers. But some people are gonna want a game in 4K. They're buying those 4K TVs. They want to see the HDR. You know, let's why don't we do that? We can charge an extra hundred bucks for it, and we we maintain the fact that we're the most powerful console on the market. Yeah, I don't know. My my you're issue. Not, is the they're not forcing you to buy it. You know, it's it's just. It's for the enthusiasts out there. True. A lot of people will get upset at these things, and it does seem to people like, you know, they're forcing it or people are going to be mad at it. You you don't have to buy it. Yeah. End of the well, day, you do not have to buy it if you don't like it. 
this this is my thought. I'll say this real quick, especially when you talk about like the Xbox Scorpio coming. We've heard rumblings in the video game uh, environment of iterative change is what we're going to get from now on to be more PC like. And if that's the case, that whole you know the excitement, the explosion of a new console or a new generation for me, that excitement is going to go away because every two or three years you're going to see something that's slightly better than what you got. So we see, I was hearing that story a lot more around the launch of the PS4 Pro and a lot less now. What I'm hearing now is that these are mid- mid-generational bumps and they're still going to be next-generation consoles, especially from Sony, right? It's, a lot of oh, people yeah. think well, we're going to see a PS5. is definitely going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. PS5, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, next month. Yeah, I mean, that's a heavily rumored thing. But so I don't, you know, to argue that the PS4 Pro is, you know, re- it's... It's taking away something from us. I think it's a false argument. I think yeah. it's just it just gave us an opportunity to play PlayStation games in 4K HDR. That's and if you want yeah. that and it's worth it to you, then cool, go ahead and get it. If it's not, then stay away. You know, the game is the same game on your PS4. They very they were very careful to say you know you won't have any advantage in multiplayer. It's going to run at 30 frames per second if it runs at 30 frames per second on both. It's going to run 60 frames per second if it's going to run 60 frames per second on both, right? So they were really careful about that. I don't know. To me, it's also too early to judge because I, the way they released this thing to developers, the, the way they announced it to developers and the way they released it was so close that I don't think we've seen software really take advantage of it yet either. And you to your so? point, basically, to, to echo Briar there, you were saying around, you know, the, the jump between PS1 and PS2 being marked. That's because you didn't get a hardware refresh for the best part of six to eight years. It was nothing that changed on that hardware. You're using hardware at the end of its life cycle that's five, six, seven years old. At least with the PS4 Pro, it won't derail the PS5 launch date. The PS5 launch date was already locked down. They knew what they were building to. They knew what they were developing to. What this has done is give people that have a console and don't have a pc that can iteratively change the ability to play their games at the resolutions they want and with slightly more power and get the best version of the current game it's not a new game it is the best version of the current game you guys are, are slowly bringing me around let me I drink, some more, the of, let me drink me some more is, of this kool-aid mm-hmm. yep yeah, i don't know i have issues with the ps4 pro it's just and i'm gonna say that i don't actually own one i need to make that clear too the problem with it for me is it just doesn't seem like it has enough purpose to exist. And the thing is, it's frustrating for someone like me, too, because it's like, you know, we expected one console, one generation, and now they're coming out with this PS4 Pro, and it's like, well, what the heck? You know, it kind of makes That's people That's fine, though, stumped. Robbie. Like, if you don't see a pr- purpose for it, then they'll buy it. That's the way I I'm see it. I'm not going it, to. Right? But again, it's but just But there are people annoying, out there though. who have 4K TVs, you know, and they, they want to see what, hey, man, I want to see what the last of us looks like on a 4k tv with looks HDR, incredible right it does. like that's it what does, I, it feels some, so unnecessary some though. people like, out there feel like enough of a step are happy running it their games it on, a 4, eight, on a rx 480 at 1080p 60 frames per second other people out there want to see what it looks like on a 4k monitor and go out and buy a 1080 ti for three times the money right and this is this is sony giving gamers that option although at a much cheaper price <sighs> i just what do don't we think want- about the argument that introducing this has divided and added toxicity to a community that never had that in the past. So by that point, um, I mean that in the past you were a united community. So the PlayStation 4 was one piece of hardware that as long as you paid your entry price, you didn't have that, as you said, Briar, where you've got better hardware, you get better visuals. Mm -hmm. Now we have a situation where people that have bought the hardware, especially as we've seen it with the Destiny 30 frames, 60 frames debate, rightly or wrongly, and whether they're misinformed or not, believe that because they have the better hardware, the people with the lesser hardware are holding back the game that they're playing. And I've seen the argument thrown around several times. It's not times. a new thing, though, either. That's been around for a while now. That was the argument people with Destiny 1, too. People yeah, we've seen Destiny the argument. Destiny 1 was on the PS3 and the Xbox it, 360. That was different, though, because that was... A, that was between the PlayStation 3 and the PlayStation 4, the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One. We've yeah, never seen that's it a generation one difference. console generation, right? Like, you've never been able to buy an upgraded SNES. Well, SNES would... What I really think it comes down to is that some people feel left out because they don't have the money. They can't afford it, right? It's some people just can't afford the PS4 Pro, and 
that creates some bitterness toward the people who can. And then, reversely, some people want every game developed with the PS4 Pro in mind. Yeah. Because they have a PS4 Pro, and that creates some bitterness to the people who didn't upgrade. Right. Right? Um, I, I don't know. That's going to be... That's, that's not going to go away anytime. Yeah, that's, that's not going to go nature. away anytime soon. Yeah. yeah, that's a great, great point. I never thought about it that way, Brian. Hmm. I'm just wondering whether or not it's added more or taken away more than it brought to the party. You know, they've added more revenue, but have they divided their community? I I don't know. I, again, I think it's too early to say. I think we're going to have to wait until it, it might be years from now until we really get a good view of what the mid generation upgrade cycle really meant for the PS4 Pro and the Xbox Scorpio. We're going to have to we're going to have to see did it actually add anything visuals wise and game wise and did it did it hurt the community? I, I don't think that's something we can answer right now while we're in the middle of it. Well, let me just say this, right? We've seen lots of games come out since the launch of the PS4 Pro. Very few of them have had really truly meaningful advances as far as frame rate and resolution over the base model. Never, well, virtually never do you see 4K native at a higher resolution than, than 30 frames per second. It's usually checkerboarded. So for I me, the game's- It's accepted the, that it's not capable. It's not gonna be able to do yeah. that. But even checkerboarded, you, you, you'll very seldom see like a 60 frames per second upgrade for a lot of these games. It just doesn't really happen. Even for single player experiences, it doesn't happen. So for me, the change is so minuscule. It's usually a resolution upgrade the, the frame rate usually stays the same. The game just looks slightly prettier on the Pro. And with that said, the PS4, the base model, the games still look great. The, res the resolution is a little bit lower, but the frame rate is predominantly the same. So I don't think it's really fragmenting the, the, the player base or Sony's uh, uh, base of, of buyers. I think that everybody who's playing the game is playing a game that looks great, but someone has a slightly better looking version. But with no real other upgrades that are meaningful to gamers. That's why it feels so pointless to me, because it's like 4K, that's it. And especially if you have a PS4, what is the point? Especially if you don't have a 4K TV, there's literally just, it doesn't feel like there's a real purpose for the Pro. I don't get it. Scorpio sounds way more in intriguing to me, because that's a generational gap, right? Like, that's going to be a true upgrade. And if we see games running at 60 frames versus 30, so you that's keep asking significant. What's the point, Robbie? And it's, I'll tell you what the point is. Seem if, like you're an enthusiast, a point. if you're an enthusiast who wants to, you know, they, they want a game on their 4K TV and you it's got so the extra minimal. cash. It's so minimal. I mean, hey, Robbie, you asked what the point is. I just told you what the point is. Just because you is don't it, see the value in it doesn't mean that others don't. Most people so don't. I don't think most the people The console do. market typically wouldn't be the, the demographic that is... I guess that conscious about their the power of their hardware, they're more about the games. And I'm generalizing mm -hmm. here, so I know that there are minorities in every um, market, and very even, loud. even this very podcast, loud. very loud minorities on this podcast. So when I'm talking about um, the the hardware itself, do we think that the console is the best place to launch power hardware? Because if you wanted true power, would you not look to the PC, which already has ports of most of the major games? Uh, I like. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I like the fact that both companies are doing this right now because I am one of those gamers. I, I would like to get more power out of the consoles. Uh, I I was going crazy with the 360 and the PS3. They were around for far too long. You yeah, know, that what needed we were, to end. Uh, you know, what we were seeing on PC was just cr cr visually crushing and physically. Like, they were just a lot, able to do so much more cool stuff on the PC than you, they could do on consoles. I was very welcoming of the PS4 and the Xbox One when they were came, come around. I was gen I was very excited about new consoles because it had been a very long time. Oh, and the fact yeah, that they are now big. thinking about updating these consoles more frequently, that's great because we're just going to... Not everybody has to buy them, but if you are you know, somebody who's an enthusiast and likes to see like the new cool developments and likes to get their hands on the new tech... Like it's very exciting. Instead of just buying an Xbox 360, putting it under your TV for nine years, you know, mm. getting something new every once in a while is pretty fun. I like yeah, that. Every, but it has to be a substantial upgrade. Like it has to be substantial enough. That's, Whereas Robbie, I said before though, I I don't think that we've seen games developed yet come to market the pro yet in mind. that have the that were developed with the pro in mind. I just don't think we've seen it because developers knew about that thing like three to okay. six months before 
we found out about it, and then it, it got released the same year they found out about it. And it takes time to v- develop games. Let, let me get, ask you guys a quick question. Have you ever had a, a PC graphics card and you upgraded to a new one that costed maybe $100 more than the original? Does that happen in the PC world often? I mean, it can. new, well, like if you're hey, comparing new, this, then this yeah, is, but there's usually a few years in between. This is what uh, Hey at CMP said, uh, and it's very true. He said, what's the point of upgrading a PC? It's because you want better graphics. It's the same thing you get with the PS4 Pro. If you have the money, then go ahead and spend it. Um, to me, it's a very similar ideology. Briar, you know I'm making an argument. Usually when a game system comes out, I'm going to buy it regardless. Mm-hmm. I bought a 4K TV because I bought the PS4 Pro. Mm-hmm. Most people do that you know, in reverse. They buy the yeah. TV and then they say, I want the Pro. I bought it. And, and when I use it for what it's made for, it's really revolutionary and amazing to me. But I'm also one of the people who can take a step back and say, wow, I, I'd spent $1,300 on this TV and I bought a PS4 Pro. And it's just for a higher resolution. Some people are fine with that. You know, other people would say, ah, I'll put this money into a PC and get 60 frames per second. It, it's really relative to the person. And, and honestly, I don't think there's any wrong with upgrade, anything wrong with upgrading to the PS4 Pro. I'm happy with it. I don't think it's a disgusting piece of hardware, Robbie. It, it actually does what it's supposed to do. And for the most part, games want to run better than they do on the PS4. And if that's all you're looking for I will out say, of the console experience. Rise of the Tomb Raider, that's the example of games that should be on the Pro. Absolutely. Things that absolutely play perfect. better and look better. That's what I mean. For Pro, most games aren't like that, though. That's where it's like, I just don't see the point of that thing. I if really I, don't. If I got a 50% FPS boost in most of the games I played, oh God, then crazy. Pro would be awesome. I would say yeah. Pro is awesome, where it's you can see it and it plays better. That's a good upgrade. But That's as this thing is out, too. I, I mean, we're already seeing more games take advantage of it. We're going to see more in the future. And I think in the Scorpio, where there's even wider margin of power, you know that, that'll be exciting to see what happens as well. Do we feel that the... The, I guess the Pro and to some extent the Scorpio seems to be falling down the same trap have had very very poor marketing messages and what I mean by that is as a consumer you don't really know what you're going to get when it says Pro enhanced on the box there's no hard and fast rule saying this game will have a better frame rate this game will have a better resolution this game will have higher graphical settings and textures and foliage etc so Rise of the Tomb Raider is a great example of a developer that managed through Square Enix, managed to um, really enhance the suite and say, you want frame rate, have frame rate, you want that. Other games, you just, you get what you get. You put in the Pro and it does something. Some games, it doesn't work at all. Some games, it gives you two things. Again, I think we're in the early days of this right now, right? It's like the developers haven't figured out what, how they want to spend their development energy for these, this half cycle upgrade, right? So as that gets figured out, hopefully we'll see more standardization because there's, an accepted, you know, path that like VR right now, right? Is like VR is all over the place. It's like there's tons of different hardware out there. People are making all sorts of weird stuff. And the video games are kind of like some people are doing locomotion, other people are like, no, we gotta do this like switching around thing. It's like everybody's just trying to figure out like what do we do with this? Once we've once somebody right. figures it out, then I think you'll see more standardization and maybe you'll see more value as well. But do you think that standardization yeah, should so. have been set by the, I guess, the, the marketplace owner? Um, and that's where Steam and, and if especially If they knew the Apple exactly Store. what to do, then yes. But if they didn't, then no. I mean, they made some rules up front. They said, no, you can't run a competitive game at a faster frame rate. You know, you can do this, you can't do that. They made some rules up front, but they did leave the door open for developers to decide how they wanted to treat their game. So I think Microsoft have built on it and Microsoft have made the comment, whether it's on the record or off the record, I've definitely heard Phil Spencer say it, that every single game will play better on the Scorpio. It's not a case of some that have been enabled. I think the comment has been made, every single game will play better on the Scorpio. So there is some Isn't that technically true with the PS Pro right now too? Because they enabled the boost mode? Boost mode is, I guess, to an extent, running the, the clock at a higher rate on games that have enabled it. It's not necessarily so. Not necessarily. Every game it runs it on better. every game, right? Every game that has not been um, uh, optimized for the PS4 Pro. Yeah. So it has a slightly higher clock speed on the CPU, I think, or is it the GPU clock speed? One of the clock uh, speeds. I don't is, know is exactly boosted. the technical of what it does, but a lot of games run a lot smoother, even if they haven't been, haven't been um, developed with the optimized. Pro in mind. Older games, you know? 
But the issue with that is there's, again, no consistency with it. So you mentioned that. Um, if we go to Final Fantasy XV, which is a game that very recent and wasn't, well, it was pro-enabled, but it wasn't pro-enabled in the way that people wanted. It was 4K30 or higher textures uh, were in there. If you run it on pro mode, there was claims that it can reach up to 60 frames per second, which it can as long as you're staring at the floor. As soon as you look at any of the, the scenery or geometry, the frame rate starts to vary wildly from 30 to 50 frames per second with no Ooh. consistency, which has made the game worse. So, you know, pro mode or pro upgrades can sometimes actually detrimentally take away from the experience. So yeah. what do we think about something that, you know, should a, a pro user ever have a worse experience? No, absolutely not. They're paying they for do. the superior upgrade. They should have... Well, I don't know about a worse... No, definitely not a worse experience. At least a similar one. So, well, there, there no, I would instances. say no with exceptions. If you absolutely want to play that game at 4K, then you are going to have a worse experience because the frame rate is going to drop, just like you would on the PC. If if the developers are going to give yeah. you the option yeah. to, to, you know, adjust... Do I want to get a high frame rate or do I want to get a high resolution? Then we we as gamers have to be happy they're giving us that choice, but also accept the fact that you know, we, you know there are going to be some compromises there, especially in the early days. One thing that we haven't mentioned is VR. So we haven't mentioned the PlayStation VR and where that fits in the whole pro ecosystem and pro position. And I think that could be down to Sony not marketing the Pro effectively enough in conjunction with VR. I don't think VR was used in the Pro announcement trailer, except for saying it has improvements to the PlayStation VR experience. And I don't think there has been a clear, consistent marketing message about exactly what it does for VR. I think it's been down to enthusiast sites like Digital Foundry to do the work, sponsored by Beastly, to do the work um, to actually find out where it's adding improvements. So... Do we think that for a PlayStation VR owner, the PS4 Pro becomes a more attractive experience? And the reason I ask that is because you mentioned right off the bat, BC, that if you were coming in cold to the PlayStation 4, you'd buy the Pro. Do you still stand by that? And how do you feel with VR? Oh, God. those. Let me unpack that because I'm in two completely different places. I haven't played my VR in a long time, but I do know that the original PlayStation 4 compared to the PS4 Pro when it comes to VR experiences has some pretty noticeable differences. Uh, I played Resident Evil, uh, Resident Evil 7 on my regular PS4 and compared to the PS4 Pro, I just felt like it was a much smoother experience. The game seemed like it just ran smoother. I don't know if the frame rate was really increased like that, but it just felt like a, it was a more cohesive experience. I don't know how it works on you know, more PS4 or PS4 Pro games, but I did notice that with the PS4 Pro, you get a better experience overall with VR. That is something I feel like they need to market more. I feel like it's something they need to explain more because if you do have to listen to Richard Ledbetter tell you uh, on Digital Foundry just how different this experience is on the PS4 Pro, then Sony's dropping the ball. Overall with VR, I think VR is a huge step in the right direction. Uh, I think we need to have more meaningful and full-fledged experiences like Resident Evil. Uh, to keep people interested in it, I feel like if, did if you played Farpoint, Farpoint came out last week. It did. Yeah, it did. Yeah. yeah. Shit. So I cancelled my pre-order for that. I was working, man. I was working, man. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I watched very closely um, to a lot of the reviews and what people have said about it. And from what I understand, the aim controller itself is a significant innovation for shooters on the PlayStation VR because it does add the capability of locomotion and adds a sense of immersion. The game itself that is shipped with Farpoint is unfortunately a mediocre corridor shooter. Mm. Um, reason for that is that... I've heard it's mediocre if it weren't in VR. Like, it, without VR, it wouldn't be good, but it's I think I'm buying perfect it anyway. the way it is in VR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just want to try it out anyway. Uh, and we got... Uh, Bridge crew coming out, I think, within the next couple of weeks, right? Oh, that's Star Trek, right? Yeah. Oh, that's man. Right so, yeah. You guys want to wrap up our two. thoughts on uh, the upgrade, the, the mid mid generation upgrade? Beastly, you want to? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll think? just say this in closing for me. It's still kind of early here. You know, the PS4 Pro dropped in November of last year. How many months is that? I think uh, as time goes on, and, and when we see the Xbox Scorpio, whatever it's going to be called, whether two or not. Weeks. <laughs> Soon. Whether or not developers start focusing more on this hardware is going to be, I guess, that'll gauge the success in the long term. Because unless you really are an enthusiast and you want the highest resolution and possible frame rate updates 
or upgrades. It, I'm looking in our comments on the Twitch chat. There's a lot of people who agree with you, Robbie. They say it just was not worth it. It wasn't really worth it as an upgrade. Until we see those kind of things, when developers say, we're going to include these new uh, uh, options for you to increase frame rate or increase resolution, like in Tomb Raider, uh, I think that this argument will go on and, and last for a long time. Gary, would it, you want to wrap up your thoughts? Yeah, so from my point, I feel like it was a misstep by Sony, one of the first missteps by Sony. I think Microsoft are very smart to do it because they don't have the games. So for Microsoft to make a hardware play, and hardware is really their bag at Microsoft, is sensible mm -hmm. and smart. You know, they build, the, you know, Microsoft have Windows, PC operating system, that's where the power is. For me, Sony was selling games on the standard PS4 or the PS4 Slim, and the Slim was also a price reduction. If Sony had doubled down on the fact that they had the cheapest current-gen console out there, it, you know, more so than the Switch, in fact, it would have been the same sort of price as the Switch, mm -hmm. they could have put a lot of clear water between them and the Xbox Scorpio. Uh, and that big price gap there that you would have paid the additional two, three hundred dollars potentially to get a Scorpio, you could have bought yourself a lot of PlayStation exclusive games. And that PS4 Slim would have been a much more attractive proposition. Unfortunately, with the Pro being in the mix, you've now got the power hardware being the second most powerful piece of hardware on the market to the Scorpio. So I don't know. It's in a difficult place right now. Robbie? I mean, personally, for me, I'm. Like I said, I'm very kind of in and out on these kind of things. I think just personally for me, I just don't really like the PS4 Pro. There are things about it I do think are really cool. 4K, yeah, having 4K support is awesome. You know, having PSVR be able to run better is nice. Again, for me, there's not enough of a purpose of it just because Sony was already doing so well with the PS4. It just didn't feel like it was really needed to come out with a Pro. And then on the other hand, Xbox Scorpio is just far more exciting to me because that's sort of a generational gap and it just seems like it could be a much more significant upgrade to me, which sounds like it would be a lot more worth it. But then again, I will also say it hasn't even officially been announced yet, right? Like we're going to see it two weeks at E3. That's when we're really going to know everything about Scorpio, the price, when it's coming out, its name. And so for me, I mean, really, I like Microsoft's execution quite a lot, at least in theory so far. And Sony's I'm not really a huge fan of. So it kind of goes either way for me. For me, a lot of the ways, in a lot of ways I agree with get what Gary said, is that it it could look like a misstep uh, when we look back on it in a few years. You know, I don't know how compelled they were financially to actually make this happen. Mm. Um, but I will say this, is that for at a, on a consumer level, while I could definitely see not seeing the purpose of it and not seeing the use for it, for me, as an enthusiast, I really enjoy my PS4 Pro. Uh, there's several games that actually run better on it, and that you know that makes me happy because I get to play games that just perform better. And That's awesome. I feel like yeah. I've gotten value out of the PS4 Pro, and will continue to get value out of it until the PS5 is introduced. Is that true for everybody? No, I think on an individual basis, you probably already know where you sit on that, right? Is like. No yeah. conversation that we're having is going to adjust your thinking. Either you want to spend $500 or $400 on another PlayStation that's got slightly better graphics, or you don't. You don't see that value. That yeah. value is a different thing for different people. It's got different levels of qualification for different people, depending on financially where you sit and where your priorities are. Um, but for me, uh, I kind of like the fact that both Sony and Microsoft are doing this right now. Uh, because it just spices things up in the middle of a generation. Yeah. Well said. Do a little news? What we got, Rob Skull? For well, sure. The first bit of news before we dive into the topic, Briar, is next week we won't be the judges and adjudicators, will we, on this segment? Theoretically, if we can get it to work correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, preview for next week. If everything works according to plan, then Briar has a little treat for the viewers in the chat, and you guys will be able to decide who has uh, put forward the most persuasive argument. So tune in next week when the uh, topic will be revealed on Wednesday, and we'll be having another roundtable discussion. Uh -huh. Hopefully there will be voting in chat. Yeah, um, I'd like to see that. If we can get it to work in a way that makes sense. <laughs> yeah for sure so definitely definitely not then basically <laughs> <laughs> all right let's do some news 
All right, let's get into the news, guys. So this basically goes straight off of what we were just talking about. In a series of tweets, Xbox Vice President Mike Ibarra has claimed that developers will not have restrictions for game performance on Xbox Scorpio, regardless of how the same game will run on Xbox One. Quote, developers are free to choose how they use the power of Project Scorpio for games. We have no requirements limiting frame rate or fidelity. Mike further clarified this will be true even for multiplayer titles across both consoles. Man. Where was this quoted from? That's, this that's was crazy. Tweets. This is what he tweeted out. All right. He's this means that you will have a competitive advantage in multiplayer on if Scorpio. you buy a Scorpio. Because you just so might. There yeah. is wow. no doubt that 30 frames per second, at 60 frames per second, you have a competitive advantage. And if they can make so that run, is... if they can so, make right. that run. It's, it, it's kind of like what you used to say about Scuff. It is cheating, and I highly recommend it. Would you fuck yeah. say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> So this has been clarified by one of the VPs at Microsoft subsequently in a tweet because exactly what you just said, Briar, uh, the mm -hmm. internet broke when this came out. So there yeah. were people screaming, so are they saying pay to win. So what it's been clarified as is that while developers have the option to do what they want with the frame rates and what they want with the visual fidelity, they think it is highly unlikely or highly improbable that any developer will choose to opt for that in a multiplayer game. Because they so wouldn't sell it for the Xbox could One, be. you think? Do you, Possibly because of that, and possibly because the fan base would absolutely erupt. Uh, I think people are aware of of the advantage that it gives if your console runs it at 60 frames multiplayer. Yeah. So I think while it could happen, and Xbox are not putting in a hard and fast rule, what they are doing is pushing the blame onto the developer. So Xbox Scorpio fans cannot say Xbox One's holding us back. They can say Bungie are holding us back, which is great. You know, it gives them the uh, the Xbox the, uh, the best position to be. That's I don't know how I feel about that, Briar. I think that um, if developers were to increase frame rate for the Xbox Scorpio multiplayer experience, that's better for people who bought a Scorpio. I mean, if you're on the yeah, Xbox, yeah, but it's a lot worse for people who bought an Xbox One. Yeah. <laughs> it's more compelling for people to go buy Scorpio. Well, let's be this honest. makes it worth the while. Nobody bought an Xbox One, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dead console. Yeah, you stole my joke, Brian. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, thirty frames versus sixty frames is a big deal. Um, you're yeah. definitely going to have an advantage, but I don't think it's an unplayable situation. No, oh, thirty like, frames per second is plenty playable, but sixty frames per second looks a lot better. No doubt. Yeah. Would you? Would that's you, the thing. Too. Would you this feel is... guilty? Would you guys feel guilty playing on your Xbox Scorpio, sixty frames per second? Versus someone on the Xbox One. No, playing you wouldn't even be thinking about no, it. No, you really I'd, wouldn't. I'd, Let's be honest. I feel, <laughs> I feel guilty when I teabag the people I beat, but I wouldn't feel guilty playing it, no. Do I feel guilty <laughs> using a 1080 to play PUBG when I know there's people out there using a potato? No. That's the same. It's the exact same uh, scenario, right? I know it is, yeah. and but, I don't feel but guilty. When you, but when you're on console, somehow they make they, they uh, you know fabricate the idea that it's a valid argument. If you have stronger hardware, you should be able to utilize that hardware. That's my thought on it. You know, nobody's complaining playing PUBG. It's a when different they space, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's like a completely different it, community. And they, it's they so play. interesting, too, because do you guys remember when they announced Scorpio last E3? They made it pretty clear that games would have parity across Xbox One and Scorpio. This is, like, completely, completely changing that message yeah. now. Yeah. The, the message, I went back and looked at that. They didn't say that games would have parity. They said that they said no game, game would be, be exclusive. Right? Yeah. yeah. No games would be exclusive to the Scorpio, which they're yeah. not. They just play better. Yeah. It's just winning. It still it's feels exclusive. like very different. Winning <laughs> is exclusive. Yeah. Winning, winning no. exclusive to Xbox no. Scorpio. You want to win? Buy it. Let, let's be real, guys. What do you guys think are the chances of a developer actually doing something like this to give Scorpio players an, an advantage in multiplayer? Mm, I mean, 50 50. I, I, I could see it happening, definitely. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's I think gonna on Microsoft first-party games, it could potentially happen where there's a vested interest to sell the hardware. Single player, though, everything will be 60 frames if this is allowed and this is true. Like every single player game will probably have that I, 60 I benchmark. Do. Okay. I do yeah, think and then that you're gonna have a 60 frames per second single player experience, and then you go into multiplayer, and they're gonna drop it down to 30. So you're 30. That with the Xbox suck. One. Well, we don't know yet. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think that there's a lot of projection again of consumers. Yeah saying that this is going to be a 60 frame per second machine we've already established that the cpu 
which handles a lot of the, you know, justifies whether or not this can hit 60 Digital frames. Digital Foundry's made that claim, and I don't necessarily yeah. believe it. Uh, again, I don't it know. depends on resolution. That's a big part of it, too. What? I mean, CPU dictates frame rate quite significantly when you look at what's then actually... Then why, you know, if I upgrade from a 480 to a 1080, do I get more frames per second? Because you're not bottlenecked on CPU and a PC. Right. You're already on a quad core. Right. This so, is, you know... They're, they're making a... They're making a guesstimate an educated guess very but, educated though Mayor. yeah i yeah, mean they're pretty educated i understand that but i'm just saying like maybe maybe not well i mean they, if you look at games like certain games are G cpu bottlenecks and certain are gpu so a big cpu yeah. test that is often done is ashes of singularity which is almost exclusively because of the amount of, of physics computations right. on the screen. It doesn't matter if you're running a 1080 Ti, you'll still bottleneck on the CPU. That's all right. It so also, it does depend on the game quite a bit too. If you're running does. Counter-Strike, then, you know, the more, the more power you throw at it with a graphics card, the better. Yeah. So I'm just saying that we shouldn't look at a misnomer saying because this has got so many teraflops of GPU power that it's a 60 frames machine. The CPU is not that much better. It's still the Jaguar core. I also don't know and, how, how much developers really value 60 frames per second. I feel like it's something that's so highly secondary. coveted. It's so highly coveted by by gamers, but yeah. developers seem to always want to put graphical fidelity ahead of it so that you know their screenshots look good on web pages and stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what they do, too. 60 okay. frames has come from a PC background as well. I mean, COD was a 60 frame champion on, on consoles. Yeah. But at the same time, I feel like it's now an expectation because people have seen PC games running at 60 that they want that on their console. I, I, I feel like that's... it's been a real stumbling block for the Xbox One and the and PS4 is that, you know, we had, we were playing 60 frames per second games or 60 frames per second games on the on and PS3. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, I don't, you know, the new consoles, I don't think were as powerful as we hoped they were. And I think we knew that yep. right away because we got a slightly higher graphical fidelity when they released, but it came at the cost in a lot of cases of fra frame rate. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. right from the get go. It, like we just, we haven't seen it kind of settle down at It's 60. been the it's same really way the whole time. Yeah. For a majority of the games that are being released, you're going to see that 30 frames per second. I mean, even yeah. now, all these years later. Absolutely right. right there. What's next? What's next, Robbie Skull? Oh, sorry. I scrolled down past my news. Crap, Look at that we? porn, man. Here we go. Now I got it. I got it. Uh, a new Dragon Age game is in development at BioWare, according to studio writer Alexis Kennedy. So basically, he came out and said, we've had an extra project we're working on, and apparently said, I can now confirm it's a Dragon Age game. So that's happening, along with their new IP and whatever else they're working on. I played about three hours of the last one and was completely unimpressed. God, bro, you're just like me, bro. Yeah, <laughs> you're just like me. I sat next to my wife. I was playing something else. I tried Inquisition with her. She beat the entire game, told me I was a loser and she's going to leave me. I didn't care. The game just didn't suck me in. <laughs> oh, wow. I, it, didn't, it didn't suck me in. I, I got her back on my team doing other stuff, Robbie. But Dragon Age, the original Dragon Age, was one of the greatest RPG experiences I've had probably in the last 10 years. It was just... A seminal kind of experience so special and that still holds true for me today so hopefully they can go back to what pulled me in about dragon age with the next one not yeah, to say inquisition is amazing this title is not enough to get me excited at this point yeah See, in inquisition and i don't know it's a, it's a strange thing that i've discovered but every guy i've spoken to didn't really get it and didn't massively get into it you every guy i've spoken to like, loved it and played like Seriously. 200 hours and things yeah like you just said your wife played it i she know other people's girlfriends game. who've played it people at game stores that i've spoken to that like obsessed with it i don't know if whether it's the team dynamic and the relationships that you had within it appealed to to something there uh, i don't want to generalize but i don't know if anyone in the chat or anyone commenting here is, is a guy who liked it then let's look at the chat you know let's let's break the uh break the curve but yeah i don't know it seemed to be a game that really appealed to, to women for some reason interesting <laughs> point gary hmm. wow What's next, Rob Skull? Yeah, who knows? Oh, all right. Red Dead Redemption 2 has been sadly delayed to spring 2018. Rockstar Games has released new screenshots of the game and have commented on the delay, stating, quote, some extra time is necessary to ensure that we can deliver the best experience possible to our fans. Did you guys see Thank those you. screenshots? Oh, my God. Oh, they're, they're beautiful. Phenomenal. Like, oh, that my game God. really does look nice. 
Speaking, and, and, that thing's gonna run at thirty frames per second, though. I bet we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you look at those screenshots. Gonna, you're like, that shit's not running sixty. I mean, it's <laughs> over the world. Yeah. Yeah. You're lost. It's gonna be the. Uh, it's gonna be the cinematic twenty-four frames per second. That's what we're gonna <laughs> look at. Oh god, yeah. Right. Yeah. Extra Lower cinematic. For a cinematic experience. Take your time, know. Rockstar. We all know what you're capable of and what you, what kind of pedigree you bring to your your game development. If you rush it, you'll be doing yourself and everybody who believes in you a disservice. So. Take your time. I remember Literally. this the exact moment this got announced because everybody in my Twitter feed said Twitter. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody on my Twitter feed said called it. Like, yeah, no shit we did. <laughs> it's a rock star game. Yeah. Of course it's the Yeah, lady. it's gonna take a while. <laughs> I'm going to be the collective voice of the internet trolls and say you're all wrong because Rockstar lied to us to get more pre-orders. What do you think? I've heard <laughs> oh, they that. lied to everywhere. us. Oh, no. Everywhere. What do you think? Why did they announce something and then less than a month later decide that, or no, a little bit more, sorry, six months later decide that, no, we're going to push it? Because I think that everyone's saying that no shit, it's not coming out. They just well, wanted to bring the trolls out of the bridge. What do we think? Did, did they lie to us to get pre-orders? I don't think so. I don't no. think Rockstar needs no. to get pre-orders. They they make more money selling their Grand Theft Auto games than virtually any other company on Earth. They know so they can take their time, too. Like They, they know they, this game's going to print money when it comes out. The company GTA 5 made a billion dollars in 24 hours, okay? They're not yeah. really concerned the about that. I, that make the best games, like the really top-rated companies, are Naughty the Dog. same companies who delay shit for years. And that's yep. not... Yes. Delaying stuff is not an indicator of quality, but the companies that do make great stuff often do delay stuff. CD Projekt Red. Yeah. Yeah. Bungie. Naughty Dog, Rockstar, Bungie. Yep. Dick Nukem Forever. Yeah, I'm not saying oh, that just because <laughs> well, it's delayed. Nine years. It was a, it was a gym. Not a gym necessarily an indicator of quality, but the companies look at Blizzard. They delay stuff for decades. Yeah. <laughs> They really do. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Generations, you know, lifetimes go by and Blizzard don't release a game. That's it. Just you know, oh, people man. have kids, grow up, die. It feels like Same that song. sometimes. But when they when they do put something on the market, uh, with very few exceptions, it is damn good. I can't Especially think of Rockstar. an exception actually. Yeah. When's the last time? I guess Diablo two or Diablo three. Sorry, released with some real problems, but they fixed that shit up pretty good. But that core game was really good. So. Reaper of Souls yeah. fixed Diablo three. It was it was a yeah. terrible, terrible game at launch. I wouldn't say it was a terrible game. It had some really shitty systems in it. The auction house, yeah, and the errors and stuff. Terrible, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the auction house. The core and all game that. play was still fun if you liked Diablo. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What's next? All right. Sony has announced that there are now over seventy million monthly active users on PSN, and over a third of them are PS Plus subscribers. 70 million that's that's crazy wait so 70 active. million psn users yeah no active users monthly active, active psn monthly active psn users and a third of those are ps plus yeah, yeah. wow 36 percent. 26 million people are paying for psn and to put this in context to the 70 million of people that have registered psn accounts only 52 million have xbox live accounts so 70 million how many how many uh playstations have they sold they sold what 60, 60 million yeah i want to say 60 65 million it's probably out now around so this is playstation 3s playstation vitas playstation 4s everything that's on the playstation network so people that will be logging on okay. purchasing games purchasing songs videos etc yeah. or just using netflix gary so do you have a are... separate account for each of your vitas <laughs> well, that's probably 65 million of those accounted for there. Yeah, you're uh, like half the Vita players I, are just I do actually your house. Have, <laughs> I do actually have a Japanese and an American account, so yes. I, oh, I do. God, there you go. Take, take a million off right there. Take a million. I think the biggest point on this is, or two points that I wanted to draw out and get us discussing, was PlayStation have a 50% lead on engaged consumers online versus Xbox, and PlayStation is only 30, well, I say only, only 36% of people are paying for PlayStation Plus. Are we surprised or not surprised by that? I'm really, really surprised by that. Um, every now and then on PlayStation 4, at least, well, PS, when I was on PS3, I never bought PlayStation Plus. I just didn't care for it. I didn't want to investigate what the perks were. You didn't need to buy, uh, to pay for it, to play online on PS3. So I was like, I'm not just going to pay $50 a year so I can get two shitty games. 
PS4 changed that. You actually had to pay to be able to play online and get these perks. And now that I've gotten these perks and I've, I've gotten over 100 free games, a lot of them are some of the best games I've played in years. On top of that, I can't understand a person having a PS4 and not playing online. I can't imagine a person having a PS4 and not wanting some of these amazing free games. It's really mind-boggling to me. You guys, Are you guys not surprised that there are so many people not paying for PlayStation Plus on PS4? Never I'm surprised that so many, many people, people don't pay for stuff. Yeah. <laughs> people are cheap. Yeah. I'm the other way. I was surprised that 36% do pay for it. Yeah, that's and the reason like I say that really high. That's a full, almost 40% engagement of people paying on top of actually having your console because as far as I know, a lot of people buy their PlayStation um, and they, they play FIFA or something similar on there and they use it for Netflix 99% of yeah, the time. Surprising you'll see people your, don't even play online really. Yeah, if you see so. your friends list, there's loads of people that were last online seven days ago currently playing Netflix. Mm-hmm. You know, just things like that. Or, you know, that, that kind of stuff is common. So for me, if you've got almost half of you, I say over a third, you know, it sits between a third and a half. That many people paying a monthly subscription just to have access to your online ecosystem, to me, that's that shows really good engagement. And you think all the yeah. children that have PlayStations, right? And they don't have access to credit cards or anything. Mm-hmm. It is, it is pretty high. I think it's pretty high. That's pretty cool. I think so, too. Yeah. I wonder what the 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 number would be on the Xbox side. No clue. They've only got 52 to 55 million people playing, so yeah, we don't know. All right, Robbie. Take us there. All right. Following a split with publisher Square Enix, Hitman developer IO Interactive has experienced a round of layoffs. That sucks, man. Mm-hmm. Hitman was mm-hmm. a fantastic game. And it it's this is no way to reward that. You know, I don't know what the hell Square's thinking here. Totally agree. Yeah. So Square are ditching the Hitman franchise. So they're selling it as a brand. So someone else is going to be picking up Hitman. The issue with Hitman, as great a game it was, Briar, it didn't sell. Um, and yeah. it just, it, partly because it was released in an episodic format, which wasn't clear to people. So there wasn't a physical disc they could buy. It was a, a code that you had. And partly because with it being an episodic comment, uh, because content, sorry, the release at drop was only a fraction of the total game, and people weren't comfortable with that. So if they had a chance to do a Hitman 2, a follow-up, I think the buzz that Hitman generated, I mean, that thing was featured everywhere. Every streamer was playing it. Every big website was doing features on it. And that didn't even, I don't. I feel like the buzz didn't even catch up with that game until like the game of the year discussions were going on. And like around that game, I think came out in like June or something like that. And like, it was all over the place in December and January. Yeah. So yeah, I would agree. Maybe it didn't sell well, but you look at the buzz that was generated by that first game. And if they came out with a sequel to it, I think, you know, I think you just, it's not long-term thinking there and to sell off the Hitman franchise, we've That's had crazy. plenty of shitty Hitman games. It was IO that figured out the formula. So, yeah, so they made it's it not really the good. franchise where the the money's not in the franchise; it's in that studio. Yeah, they need to bring they're that studio with, back for Hitman too. I think it's just short sighted. They're selling them with IO, so wherever Hitman goes, IO are going to, or what's left of them, the skeleton crew. So the whole studio plus the IP is being sold. So the IO yeah. kept the kept the. They did. Square Enix is a cold cut, as it said. It's a split with the publisher, so they don't want to publish IO games anymore. So I wonder, oh, okay. I wonder if some another company will pick them up. Well, apparently Hitman Two is already forty percent developed, so there's a game mm. that's got its core elements on Hopefully the table. Hopefully, another you know another publisher picks them up and they can rehire the employees that they need to. Yeah, maybe that would be a good get for Microsoft and yeah, for Scorpio. Would be maybe good that's what they Microsoft, need because that's a great PC game and it's a great console game. Yeah. That would be good for them. Really I well, think they should do it. Their infrastructure. It'd be a nice exclusive for them too. That would be nuts. Yeah. Imagine if they acquired that yeah. like today. So that yeah, it, Phil Spencer, they, if you're watching, buy this, we know you watch the show, Phil. Also, if you haven't played that <laughs> Hitman game, give it a shot. It is really it's awesome. fun. It's especially I, I it, fun very... if you do it with people in the room with you. I've played it with my wife and. The murder uh, in the, her eyes, man. The murder. We scary. talked about the murder. It's lately. a little bit scary. <laughs> in her eyes, it's scary. <laughs> but I mean, it's she's really cool. She's like, oh, it's fun. It's fun to play. 
it's a it's a fun couch game with your friends. It really. I've is. only gone through the very first level, and then I've drifted off to something else. The very first level on the boat, Briar, is the very first one that I've done. Oh yeah. And I stepped away from it. Yeah. But, uh, that game the opens ways up. That you can kill people is insane. It's that nuts. game opens up. Give it another shot, Beastly, because once you actually get to a real level and you discover the possibilities, and you know they have so many other systems. Like you can, you have these uh, kills that. They just pop up. I think it's like once a month where it's just a limited opportunity to get a kill. I can't remember what it's called. It's like limited time target or something like that. And once it's gone, it's gone. You can never play it again. Oh, it's wow. Just there for like a week. Yep. They're constantly at, or they were constantly adding new stuff to the game. The game's got a ton of content. So it's a really fantastic wow. game. It's a shame that what happened to IO because so you, you said it's they good finally to with your wife made a great Hitman game. Wow. Yeah. 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 All right, Robbie, what we got next? All right, Far Cry 5 has been officially announced this week to be released on PS4, Xbox One, and PC on February 27th, 2018. I was right about the release date. I said it would be February. Not right about the setting, though. The game will be set in modern-day Montana, a first for the series, and will feature two-player co-op. The story follows a group of survivors fighting against an attempted takeover by a religious cult known as the Project at Eden's Gate. Wow. So what do we think? Modern day Montana for a Far Cry game. I definitely didn't think that would happen. This is the first time I've been really interested in a Far Cry game in a very it's long only time. For, yeah. Really? Is it, is it because yeah. of the mug, bro? It's well, I do I do the want the mug. mug. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. I want the beer I mug. I want to get it too. <laughs> but the the idea of like having like this religious kind of like isolationist cult out there, like is a far more interesting bad guy than any of these other ones they've done. And Resident Evil 4, man. Yeah. Super interesting. So, it's yeah. really cool. It's a cool setting to me. I'm really looking forward to getting this game. I shared your sentiment, Briar. Um, I was really, really... When I saw the trailer go out, The Last Supper, um, which was reimagined... Or not the trailer, sorry. The promo image. The Last Supper reimagined with alt-right, bearded, religious men. You know, it looked to me like Westboro Baptist Church on acid. You know, like a real Christian fundamentalist group that were, that were going to go out there and, and cause some trouble. I was down for that. I was down for a Deliverance-style game where, you know, it's a survival game feeling like The Last of Us where, you know, you're going into a convenience store and finding five bullets and you've got to try to get to the next place and kill these guys and take them down. And then I saw the trailer and I thought, no, this is this is Far Cry. This is just Far Cry. So if you watch the, the, the large reveal trailer, and this might dampen your, your interest a little yet. bit, okay. um, first... 30 seconds to a minute is the pastor talking and it's going around the town and looking hyper realistic. And these guys are going you know, room to room with shotguns and, and rounding up the townsfolk and bringing them under that. And the last um, minute just goes into sort of hillbilly music and crop dusters and people <laughs> being chased by bears. Away. And it just, it looks like explosions going off everywhere. Bikes doing jumps over cars. To me, it just, it looks like far cry. And then what really, summed it up i watched some of the 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 coverage that showed what was in the game and they said oh don't worry the things you liked about far cry primal being carried forwards you can hire bears and hire honey badgers to come and help you on your quest and i was just like you know what they've, what? they've completely lost the mark you know if you're going really for a, they said that yeah if you're going for I a smart you fresh dogs take, but that's, oh, that's very strange to me but that's if they can nail weird. the story i i can forgive the the video gaminess of of it really yeah I, yeah i mean all games when you look at the nitty-gritty video games are video games right it's like they all mm -hmm. you there's a certain amount of uh i, I can't remember the term but you, you just got to kind of like forget that you're playing a video game for all video games right there's you know right. there's the video gaminess of a video game if they can get a really cool story in there and they can make me feel like i'm involved in like fighting this or like Cult, investigating yeah. this culty thing. I mean, it's just such a cool, such a cool setting. It I really would be crazy we, we really with that religious seen, cult. Yeah, we haven't seen anything uh, like this since like Las Plagas. Suspension right? of Resident disbelief. Evil. That's what I was trying to. Yeah, it came to him. You guys remember the Las Plagas from Resident Evil Four? The cult that Leon yeah. was taking out. Yeah, it's kind of like you know what I didn't like about that is I, I loved later in that game where it got crazy, like with the like that little midget character and like. But it, they never really, they never really made good on that, that kind of scary culty feel. I, I'm not, I'm not dissing that game because where they did go was really fun and really entertaining. But that, you know, that back hills like 
cult thing. Mm -hmm. It's such a cool setting. And Resident Evil didn't really go there with that. You know, they did kind of get Resident yeah. Evil with it. I haven't seen yeah. this trailer, but it sounds like this is the direction that they want to go with this story. And it's, we haven't seen anything like that, like in any game in modern history that I can think of. So, Especially talk about possible controversy, too, with very religious, heavy tones like this. It could be yeah. very, very interesting to see. Like, how in-depth do they get with that, too? Do they kind of pull back on it, or do they really go all in and have some really I like, hope they go all in, because that crazy yeah. religious shit happen. That'd be really I fun. I hope so, too. Yeah. There was so, a movie a while back with a... Kind of had a similar theme. I can't remember the name of it, though. It was like a horror movie. Mm. Anyway, go ahead. I mean, the story sounds brilliant, but yeah. Yeah. And even, Gary, when you were saying this looks like a Far Cry game, well, I think there's also a reason why they called this Far Cry 5, right? They're saying this is the next main game, so clearly it's going to be like that, and you're going to be able to hunt animals. You know, there was a man with a rifle shooting an elk, and there was bison. There's even cows. Hopefully you can hunt cattle. That would be, that would Robbie be likes great. Hunting just regular I cows. Know. That'd be funny. That'd I be feel really like funny. if you're going to touch something as topical and something as fresh and innovative as alt-right fundamentalism, especially in a religious setting, I feel like that should be handled with a bit of sensitivity and it's something that I want to see done. You know, make these figures as scary as they need to be. I think as soon as you give me two assault rifles and a bazooka and a crop duster with armoured machine guns, it doesn't matter what I'm fighting now. I'm not. I'm not fearful of it. But if I'm powerless and these guys are stalking me room to room with a double-barreled shotgun and they have the, the ability to kill me, I don't know. I, I, just, I feel like I want to. I want to be scared by these people's words, not by the amount of guns that they're packing. I, I really want the yeah, past to be I want these people to be intense fear. to scare yeah. you. I totally agree with you. Yeah, I want them to be like say well, some really crazy and do some crazy shit to you and be like, whoa. Well, let, let wow. me just say this real quick, right? It's an open-world game. Far Cry is a huge game, and and and. A majority of the story isn't going to happen in this trailer. So you might be projecting a little bit, Gary, because of the other things you saw in the trailer. I'm sure, or at least I hope, that they're able to convey that sense of dread, that sense of fear from this cult of people during certain parts of the game, cutscenes, uh, interactive uh, elements of the game where you are you might be in dire straits in a situation where someone is coming room to room to kill you. I would just hold off uh, prejudging it until at least we get our hands on it and we hear more about it because I love the idea what they're doing here and I, I just my mind I can't imagine a game with this type of story just going to be so happy go lucky and you're out in the in the world chasing rainbows I, you know it's an open world game those other elements exist but I think that a game like this they're going to have to follow that it's like a template for this type of story and, and hopefully I'm not wrong and uh, this game is something enjoyable for you but I do I, I do understand your perspective here yeah, I'll probably wait for reviews on this one because it it definitely has me interested. Yeah, same here. Early next year, guys. We'll see how it turns out, and we'll see it at E3, I'm sure. Two weeks. I will right, definitely Robbie. buy it and put it on my shelf for two years yep. and sell it back to GameStop. Two years. <laughs> at least you got the beer mug. Though. Yeah, he'll be using that beer mug. Key. So <laughs> That won't sit around too long. <laughs> no, that would be a lot of use. All right, Robbie. All right. Square Enix president Yosuke Matsuda has stated this week that both Kingdom Hearts 3 and Final Fantasy 7 Remake won't be released anytime soon, not until, quote, the next three years or so, and that both games, quote, still have a long ways to go. Oh, that's this a real comes... shame. What's the next piece of news? This comes just <laughs> after the development team of Final Fantasy 7 Remake. There's Stated one. They were urgently Hold on, a large number of staff. Hold on, Robbie. You actually went team. to the next story? We got to talk about that. Come on. Yeah. There's there's one really big thing that we missed out of that, the detail, uh, and that's the Square Enix have confirmed that they're going to be hitmanning this series, um, which is great because we discussed it earlier. This is going to be an episodic launch for both Final games. Final Fantasy 7, yeah. So 7 and, and Kingdom Hearts 3. And Kingdom oh, Hearts 3, they've confirmed it no. across the board. Oh, so God. what's interesting about that is they dropped the developer for Hitman because they felt that that format wasn't successful. Never but now the they've adopted. Again. Do we think that it's good to have games as services where you don't buy a DLC, you buy the $60 game, you get it earlier, and the game continues to drip feed you content over the year. However, that content will be lighter at launch. What do we feel about that? Mm. I, I don't like it, to be totally honest. You know, it depends there's, there's, on the game. It depends on the game, what kind of game it is. Yeah, I mean, I was just yeah. going to say that, right? To have the right I, I'm, used to it with, I'm used to it with Telltale Games. That's the way it's been done with them from the beginning. So if there's a new episode of The Walking Dead coming out, Gardens of the Galaxy, something like that. You you, you know what you're getting. You're going to get a couple-hour experience, wait for a couple weeks or a month, 
for the next one. But if there's established franchises that have been out for years and decades, you're used to getting a full-fledged experience when you purchase that product. Now, Kingdom Hearts has always been a standalone product. It's never been episodic. It's never been ripped in half and multiple discs. It's always been a standalone product. Final Fantasy, they got away with it because Final Fantasy VII initially was a three-disc game. And certain aspects were locked away and partitioned on different discs. So to me, they were able to sneak that one in. But if they wanted to start doing this with well-established franchises and make them super episodic, I think it could it could end up hurting them in the end. Because once you play a game and you, you get done with that experience and you got to wait for a few months or however long they want you to wait, when it's time for the next experience, you're going to have to go back and play it again, the original, so you can remember where you were. Because it's like watching a TV episode. Every week you need a refresher at the very begin, beginning to see what you missed or what, what happened. And if you're playing a game every couple of months, when it's time for the new episode to come out, you're really going to be completely at a loss of what you did a few months ago playing Final Fantasy VII or Kingdom Hearts. I think it's a bad decision with certain types of games. And if a game is already established that that's the way they've done it in the past, I think Square needs to respect that and give gamers what they're used to. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't understand why they felt the need to announce these games so, so early, though. Right? Kingdom Hearts 3 was announced almost four years ago, and they're saying it's arriving in the next three, three years, years or That's so. insane. Like, what have you been doing? Are you just sitting there scratching your ass? Like, they literally you know what? The, the funny thing Final is... Final Fantasy VII, like, they're saying now they need to recruit people urgently. The game's been in development multiple years. What are you doing? Didn't you they know? win? Didn't they, Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't they win oh E3? God. Didn't they win E3 2015? Sony with the reveal of Final Fantasy VII Remake? Was that 2015? It might have been 14. Yeah, it, 14 it, might have been, it might have been 14. If they showed this game and, and if they showed this game this long ago and they did a reveal so of it this long ago and they need three more years, that's completely beyond the pale. And it's very it's irresponsible to make your, your consumer base salivate at the mouth at something so exciting and make them wait for a damn decade, you know, Especially before Kingdom the game Hearts comes 3, out. Like, it feels like that game is never going to come out now. That's just, oh my God. I'm not going to gonna dwell on no. it anymore. We got other news to cover, but it's a really, it's insane that they would do that. Robbie, what do you got next? It is uh, rather crazy. All right, so Tom Holland of Spider-Man Homecoming fame will be taking on the role of Nathan Drake in the upcoming Uncharted movie. Mm. What do we think? That's an interesting direction to go. And the reason super that, young... What was uh, his name again? Yeah. I gotta Google search him. Tom, Tom Holland. Holland. He's doing <laughs> Spider-Man. He's Spider-Man. He looks like the first boyfriend that your daughter would bring home in, like, seventh grade. That's kind of <laughs> how you'd... Uh... My Wait, daughter is ain't bringing home nobody. Man is he Spider-Man from Spider-Man 3? Is he Spider-Man from The Amazing Spider-Man? Or is he Spider-Man from oh, this one. Uh, Iron Man? The movie. new movie. Homecoming, um, yeah. The, the, the new one. And he was in, he was in um, spoilers if you haven't seen it, he was in uh, a scene in the... Civil War. Civil War, yeah. Uh, Captain America Civil War. The and he's going to play who? Nathan Drake. Nathan Drake. Before he lifted any weights or picked up a barbell. And so, maybe there's well, maybe there's two Nathan Drakes, like a young Nathan Drake no. and an old Nathan Drake. This is a or they're story. in a parallel universe, some crazy <laughs> shit like that. Who knows? I think in the Whatever, it's a saw... video game movie, it's going to suck anyway. Who cares? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> yeah, He's telling the truth, <laughs> man. Even when they <laughs> like... Go ahead, go. You. you know, you've got... The reason that I thought this was worth highlighting is that they've gone for such a, a, a quality actor, someone with caliber and someone that can act, that can carry that comedic, smart you know wise cracking sort of guy that also has a sense of i guess you know drama around him and because they've not gone for a typical casting choice you know gone for tom hardy or someone that looks like they could be that nathan drake character i think it might be a fresh original take on the form the formative years of nathan drake and something we've not seen in an uncharted game could so be. i don't know i've got high hopes for this one could be Listen, track record Michael, of video games Made the movies not on your Four. side. Zero out of ten. We'll see. Let me, this let is probably just, the fourth decision they've made so far that's going to make this a hor horrible movie. Four, <laughs> at least the six. Gary, <laughs> Michael Fassbender is a very uh, good actor as well. Who has lots of degree of, of acting ability. Yeah. He's funny. He can be serious. And you see what happened with Assassin's Creed. They had a great actor. They put him in a movie that everyone thought was going to be amazing, and it happened to be a video game based film. And we all know how that goes. I'll give you uh, that. All right. What Has we got next? Seen the Assassin's Creed movie? No. 
Okay. I was just wondering if anyone. But seen I heard it, it was bad. I, I didn't want to see it. Just heard it was terrible too. Yeah. yeah. I wanted it. To I, I saw the trailer. I thought that was terrible. Yeah, I, I don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Take two investor call leaks a suggested Borderlands 3 reference as releasing by the end of next year of yeah. 2018. Look yeah. at him go. Look at him go. Briar. Oh my. So, did you guys see the tech demo at GDC 2017 where they yep. didn't show the character's face but they showed the engine that they're going to be using? Yeah, when Randy Pitchford talked about I did not the see engine that. they were using. I didn't it see it. It looks great if you yeah. want to check out it's gdc 2017 cool. presentation it's about 10 minutes long and they show some of the lighting effects they show shadows um peering through uh, it's almost like a a piece of rag doll cloth that's hanging on a washing line and you can see movement through it cool. it's a really really good um looking game and something that's that's Is it stunning so cell, cell shaded still cell shaded but it's, it's the next level i can't wait to see what borderlands looks like in a post destiny world right Oh my yeah. god. Yeah, because Destiny did take a lot of inspiration they from sure Borderlands. Did. For yeah. sure. They sure did. Like no doubt about it. And like after we've had the division and Destiny, what does a new Borderlands game look like? I can't wait for this game. I, can't I want it so badly at E3. I really what? do. Yeah. Let me ask you guys a question. Borderlands, Kate and I played that. That was one of the games we bonded over when we first met years ago. Yeah. What if you can play through the campaign with like six people online? Would that be something that you guys would be interested in? Six people. Well, that would be, be fun. fucking awesome. It'd that'd be, be a lot of fun, man. It'd be like yeah. Destiny in a way, with more loot. I mean, I, I want to be the first to say that on the, the 29th of May that Borderlands 3 is going to kill Destiny 2. I just want to put that on the record there. <laughs> Destiny 2, oh. dead game. Ripping you know? pieces, Destiny 2. Ripping wow. pieces. I wouldn't you mind, got... you know, I wouldn't mind seeing some more MMO-ish aspects to Borderlands. I think that could be a lot of fun. God, that world you... with some more kind of like open world multiplayer aspects a lot of fun it's it's, it's made it's made for it Briar. it's perfect for that kind of addition it, yeah. it was it was before its time and now it's after its time but it can actually go forward again and revolutionize gaming mm -hmm. in the same way jokes aside i would like to see something good come out of gearbox because the pre-sequel wasn't what people thought it was going to be and no. then Battle that was Ball. a different developer anyway it was, but it's still the same. Battleborn. It was it? Gearbox and you know. 2K Australia. I want to say it was two studios. But yeah, you know, they Battle shut Ball down. Came out dripping with style. It was it was oozing style. You had like Deltron, like Del the Funky Homo Sapien doing anime intro. Really good game, um, and then it just didn't hit the mark with anyone. It so. is a great game. Uh, yeah. I, love that. I love of, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good Overwatch. game. It's a great yeah, game. It just, it just came, came out, out at the, the same wrong time, time as Overwatch, Overwatch it and it got yeah. horribly yeah. missed time. Everyone said, like, this is a bad idea, don't do it. They're like, no, <laughs> so we don't care, release it to me. This is, if this is coming out full. It's almost as bad as releasing Tomb Raider the same day as Fallout <laughs> Fall 4. Fallout 4. <laughs> Everyone was like, you're out of your <laughs> mind, do that. The game is good. Set to die. They're was, like, no, nope, we're that was doing actually it anyways. Worse. Great job. If this is coming out fall 2018, that could line up for a Destiny 2 expansion. And if you've got a Destiny 2 expansion which is, you know, taking King level and Borderlands 3, that, that could be a problem for Borderlands. I mean, be honest. Or, mm. you know, a year after Destiny, people might be getting sick of Destiny and be ready for something new. And Borderlands, a lot of the same people yep. who play Destiny were also previously very in love with Borderlands. Yep. Like, it's a very similar group of people in a lot of well, ways. The, the yeah. Twitch directory was a, a Borderlands directory, really. A lot of the, the big guys, so... Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. What cool. we got, Robbie? All right. Twitch has added new features this week to multiple games, including Destiny, Hearthstone, League of Legends, etc. For Destiny, it brings gear and stats and loadout commands and functions as standard more streamer tools, including heat maps for activity recommendations. What does this mean? I want access to this so bad. So yeah, there's awesome. a group of six streamers who aren't necessarily the largest streamers. Some of them are, but they're people that are working with Twitch to pilot this. So this is King Gathalian, Ninja with Noel, Gigs, Syntax7, um, BurnBX, and my name is Bife, I think are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. So this will give you functionality to answer the core questions that you see in chat all the time. So what primary are you using? What's your loadout? What, uh, you know, what, what perks are you using? Core things like that that won't actually be commands in chat anymore. It will be accessible through a UI overlay on Twitch. 
so it, this is this is just for destiny but there's there's obviously features like hearthstone you can see what deck the people are carrying league you can see how the teams are built the other thing that's really interesting for yourself as a streamer briar and i'd love to hear your thoughts on all of this is you can get heat map recommendations to see where your viewer spikes in real time when you go into an activity and your viewers can request uh, through a voting system that you're not initiating what they want to see you be playing so how do you feel that this changes the Twitch environment for you? And do you think this is something that's going to be positive or detrimental to the experience? There's a bunch of things, right? The, the thing where I can see heat maps and viewers can request, a little mixed on that. Heat maps are okay, but it's important not to overanalyze your viewership and to make sure you're having fun when you're playing video games. If you are constantly worried about, oh, I get the most viewers when I'm doing strikes, but I fucking hate doing strikes... You know, it's time mm. to leave the numbers behind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's interesting. Just don't make it your life's goal to get more viewers, right? Because that's the path to madness. It is very cool. More information is always a better thing, though, right? It's always a better thing. Having people request what they want you to do, that could be cool if you're open to it. It could be a super annoyance if you're not. Having the commands to to answer frequently asked questions is amazeballs. Like there's no downside to that. <laughs> amazeballs. <laughs> right? There's no downside. Here every day. Yeah. Um, I mean, currently we have commands in chat for a lot of those questions. Like if you type capital or if you tap primary, then it'll t tell you my primary weapon or secondary or special or whatever. And it'll, it'll tell you because it can go into the API and take a look at it. If this is a pilot program, I hope they kind of figure out like what works, what doesn't work, and then give options to streamers to really allow them to customize the tools as well, right? If you opt in, do you have to opt into the whole program or can you opt in just to the commands and leave the chat interaction or the, the chat right. voting out, you know, like that kind of thing. But yeah. it is, it's a really cool program and the fact that it's actually looking at the API for the game is amazing. That's cool stuff. That's we're living in the future. The mm -hmm. brave new world. <laughs> Welcome to the future. The brave That's it. new world. All right, Robbie, what do we got? All right, I think this will be our final news story for the day. We'll cover. Oh, you think PUBG. so? PUBG. Do you? PUBG. you think so? It's gotta be PUBG. <laughs> oh, PUBG. Okay. Okay. PUBG. Okay. Calm down. <laughs> Player Unknown's Battlegrounds made more revenue in April than CS:GO in Overwatch in both box sales and in-game currency as an early access title for a total of thirty-four million dollars. You can buy boxes. That's pretty and amazing. They, so box sales, as in you know retail sales retail. and in-game currency, yeah. totaled up to thirty-four Those million dollars in one month. Just it was a new game. Does it really? I mean, it's competing against. It's not a new games. game. And that's where it's interesting. That's it's not even released. Old. It's it's not. It's not. It's zero months old. It's uh, minus. It's early access. Five okay. months old. But it, yeah. So that's where it gets interesting. So you're it's talking five about five months old. CS... It's, been a, it's been a retailer available for five months. I think it was an alpha build five, and then it was released as early access three months ago. Yeah. Two and a half months ago. March. Okay. I think it was about two months. I mean, so, you look at in the Steam directory. It is top three every day, all day. Wow. YouTube videos are going ape shit. You know, it is people are playing this game and loving it. Viewership for people streaming it is very high. And you could you know why? Because it's fun to play, but it's also fun to watch fun somebody to watch. else play. It is yeah. like you're just you get invested into this like 30 minute episode of somebody going out there seeing like what what kind of loot they can find. It's like a little adventure every time you play and it's very compelling to watch as well. Now, I, I know you're a fan. Um, well, most of us here are fans, but I had a couple of concerns on this one. So one being peak interest on a game before launch. Is that a good thing? So a lot of these people have already made their purchases. So I've bought this game. You've bought this game. Robbie's bought it. Beastie's bought it. When they release the game, we're not buying it. We've bought it. The box sale's right. already done. Yep. So how do they hit the charts at like retail when a lot of the core audience is already there? Same thing with Twitch. Twitch is a cyclical beast, and certain games will transcend that, things like Destiny and Hearthstone League. But a lot of games will be popular for a month, maybe two, and then they'll fall off the face of the earth. But this one's different, because so game... exactly what you're saying is it's got the slow build. It didn't start off top three at Twitch. It's climbed its way there. 
It's not like mm-hmm. Zelda Breath of the Wild where it launches and everybody's playing it the week it launched. No, this is word of mouth. It's spreading through. Like, this game is great. It's spreading by word of mouth, and that's the best kind of thing you can get. That's how Robbie and I bought it. The The only way that they can make a retail sales just boom is bringing it to a new audience. That's why you hear the rumblings of possible console launch. Xbox Are they were to bring this thing to the Xbox, PlayStation confirmed. 4 possibly, that's a huge deal. Big deal. And my last concern on that one is, do you feel that potentially if they could overcome the, the Twitch viewership issues and the, the box sale issues, at the moment, they're only making money on microtransactions for cosmetics, like how you look, and sales for the, the price of it on Steam, the admission price. Are you concerned that we might see a pay-to-win model coming in? Because there is a Chinese developer behind this, it. Blue Holes Chinese. But I know it would kill it, but at the same time, people would potentially buy it to start with med kits, start with bandages. You know, if you could buy a box that gave you... I a- don't see them doing that. I think it'll just be cosmetic things and just more ways to buy those crates. They, they've already it. said that they're planning on increasing the amount of cosmetic items you can get in those crates. I didn't even know yeah. they were for sale, to be honest with you. No. I thought the only way to get them was to earn them. Uh, but yeah, Me too. cool. Like, I have no problem with in-game purchases as long as they're cosmetic only. As soon as you add yeah. a, you know, uh, overpowered bow to The Last of Us multiplayer, fuck you, I'm out. <laughs> That's exactly what happened, Briar. Well, I mean, if they go the way... That's the day Briar left. If they go no, the way... King... before that, be real. <laughs> H1Z1, King of the Kill, have you seen the price that some of those skins go for? I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Oh, man. Yeah, people are selling them as Steam gifts, the code for it's it, to get it. Like so CSGO got... skins, too. Those yeah. are a hot thing, too. Yep. So that, wow. that could be a market they go into if they're talking about expanding that. So just some concerns that I wanted to wear. That doesn't bother me at all. If, if As long as the in-game trans- microtransactions or major transactions <laughs> are uh, cosmetic only, great. As soon as yeah. you start adding pay-to-win stuff, yeah. Nope. It's and dead. hey, you know what? If you want to buy a three thousand dollar hot pink skin for your AR, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's free yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah, good, I good uh, investment decision. as yeah. well. You know, that just means that there's more chance of me taking your money. <laughs> <laughs> a fool and his money. You know, <laughs> it's good so for me. It's good. Money, it's yeah. good. It makes my heart warm to know so many idiots have so much money. <laughs> Because <laughs> <laughs> talking about idiots spending money, what are us four idiots going to be spending our money on next week? What are we buying? What are we playing? Uh, I am playing Friday the thirteenth uh, this coming week. Actually, tomorrow. I'm playing that tomorrow with the Destiny Community Podcast crew. Uh, we'll be awesome. playing that. I think at three p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. I'm really looking forward to that. Hell yeah. Um, I'm also looking to buy uh, Star Trek Bridge Crew. I don't know if that actually comes out this week, but we'll see. If it does, I'm going to be looking to play that with you guys, uh, specifically Beastly and Gary, because I've been looking to that forward to that game for a long time as a huge Star Trek fan. Uh, and then we are going to be playing PUBG again on Tuesday night around 5.30, 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, depending kind of just... Around five thirty six. We're not exactly sure the minute. Whatever basically gets on. Yeah. <laughs> basically. Slam basically. Damn on. damn job. Stop holding us back. Oh, you basically well, what you got going on this week? I'm going to be playing PUBG. I want to get a little bit of practice in. I'll go in go in alone and brave the world on my own. Uh, probably after the show tonight and uh, tomorrow. Deep. Balls deep, sir. I'll be uh, and I also tonight if you want to team up. Word. <laughs> Thug life. I'm in. Just let me know right. when. Three We're all set better with friends, you know what hey. I'm saying? Hey. All right, cool. Hey, three. You getting it in tonight? Three way. Yes. Three way. Yeah, three yeah. way. Novo yeah. boys. Novo boys. <laughs> <laughs> Novo boys. I'm also going to uh, start start playing Near Automata, which is which was a gift to me from my older brother Joe. What's up, Joe? We didn't talk to you in a while. Uh, that's a game that I played the demo of. I loved it. Gary talked about it a few weeks ago. He loved it, and my brother said uh, he said, "Beastly, this game is a game that you have to have. I'm going to buy it for you." So he bought it for me. I haven't had a chance to play it. I've been working so much this week, but I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a good week. Hell yeah. You've got some videos for us as well, haven't you, basically? Uh, you've been talking about a really interesting video that you've got coming this week. Is this? Yeah, is well, this uh, the first half of the video uploaded this morning uh, did Russia affect our election, the 2016 presidential election. You guys come to my YouTube channel and check that out. It's a very intriguing video. It's 11, min- 11 minutes long, 
and the second half should be up tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest. I got my new camera, as you guys can see, my C922. I'm loving it. And so I'm, I'm definitely going to finish that up either tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest. I might buy one of those, Beastly. I, I really like that camera. Uh, Miss 5000 Watts uses it, too, and she really likes it, too. I need a second webcam. I might get one of those. She's Is really cool. Be... She's, she's, she's like a, a prettier version of you. Right. What's the okay. uh, second webcam for? I'm, I'm, That's I'm gonna... the first time I've ever even heard that, but all right. I'm going to hazard a guess and say Bri's going to have a 24-7 crotch cam just on all the time. That's it. How did no you know? What he's doing. That's it. You know, you we almost like made it. We almost like made it all the way through the show without a dick joke. But boom, Gary pulls it out. Nice job, Gary. Uh, Thanks, Gary. I, I've, had, I've, I've had it out for most of the show. Just the camera cuts out. Yeah. What are you playing this week, Gary? So this week, I'm hoping to get back into Final Fantasy. It was heartbreaking losing 35 hours on 13. So I'm going to Wikipedia the rest of the plot and find out what happened in 13, just because I'm not going to play back through that uh, and jump in at 13 too. So I'll be playing Final Fantasy 13 too. Dark Souls 3, I need to play more of because I'm in love with that game i'm really really enjoying it and it's, it's such a reward in playing a souls game uh, and then i'm going to be dabbling in PUBG as well with you guys and you know I'd, i i try i, I struggle to say i'm going to play PUBG because when i get on it i know that it's an evening lost and i don't like sitting down and you know doing that because I, I play one game and then it turns into six hours and then it's 3 a.m and my fiance shouting at me and i'm tired so yeah i, I try not <laughs> to play PUBG. <laughs> Yeah, it's just not. You're doing um, something right, so you. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. I thought you said shouting as in shooting, kind of like when a uh, Briar team shot me just not that long ago. Remember that Briar? Yeah. Everyone yeah. here except Beastly has killed you. Oh, so I ran I you over with a Dacia. Uh, that Beastly just sounds like Briar. an opportunity to me. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta write not, this wrong, Beastly. <laughs> not fully yeah. bonded till you've just whacked that Canadian. You know, just I'll, take him I'll out. Be seeing you oh tonight, my God! Man. Whoa. <laughs> He ran That's over it. Robbie and he apologizes for being in the way. I know how Canadians work. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't apologizing over. to me, Beastly. <laughs> That's it. Next time Beastly runs into the woods, he'll be behind you. Robbie, squeal, piggy, squeal. It's just going to yeah. happen, you know? What? Oh. <laughs> All right. So that's everybody, right? Robbie, Robbie. did you tell us what you were going to play? <laughs> Jeez. Um, more PC stuff, I'm sure. Be dabbling into some games. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been addicted to PC gaming this week. I really have. Can't wait to play more PUBG, Bioshock Infinite. I love that game. Haven't played it in years, so finish that. And maybe start up some other things, too. PC boys. Sounds PC good. Race. All right, Beasley, hit him with that outro. Thank you guys so much for joining us today for another episode of Beasley Thoughts Live. We go live every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. You guys know where you are. The show is also uploaded to YouTube at Briar Rabbit's channel and Beastly Gamer channel. If you can't watch the live feed or the video format, you can now listen to the show in podcast form on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service. Thank you so much again for joining us and hanging out with the crew. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. All right, guys. See you next week. All right, guys. Take care. And real lack of dick jokes this week. I don't know. <sighs>